Today we're just going to do a quick run through of Psalm 2 and spend most of our time on Psalm 23. Uh, I want to come back uh, because of the changes in our schedule along the way and it intended to cover Psalm 1 and 2 together because they form really an introduction to this entire collection. And if you remember Psalm 1, you know, the don't stand and sit and you know, hang out with the scoffers and the skeptics, but instead, you know, delight in the law of the Lord and meditate on this. You know, one of the real overarching themes of this introduction is you should really think about God and his word and, and sit with it, rest in it, meditate in it. Then Psalm 2 comes and has also another overarching message. And so the thing I want to ask you to do as we read through Psalm 2 this morning, I'm going to ask you to ha ask in your mind, well, what is, what is the overarching theme? Or what are one or two of the overarching themes in Psalm 2 that's prepping people to think about this whole collection? how to use this collection. So Dylan, I know you just sat down, but I'm going to ask you, if you would, to read, as we go through Psalm 2, read it for us. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron you will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise, be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss his son and he will be angry and your way will lead to your destruction for his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Thank you. So, the question is, what as one of these two introductory psalms, what sort of the overarching message for getting into the psalms? What's he trying to remind people who would use this collection? What, what should they keep in mind? God is sovereign. Yeah, what, what do you mean by God is sovereign? Well, no matter what we plan or what our rulers plan or what the world thinks, God is going to dictate in a way everything that transpires. He's going to use us for his glory no matter whether we, whatever we choose. Yeah, things are going to work out the way in the big scheme the way God is. And kind of connected to that then therefore what should we do? Kiss the son. Yep, yeah, right. So appreciate the father and the son, the anointed one, and take refuge in him. You know, think about it. Even in 1000 BC, when this was written, and you read Proverbs or things, look, we have lots of things calling us, and voices around us, and things going on in culture, but that's not new. You know, you read Proverbs, you realize, well, all the, lots of this stuff is going on. And it's so easy to take refuge and to listen to and be drawn by or even be frustrated by and have that create problems for you. Things going on around me, voices. But he says, remember, God is in control. His anointed is here. And therefore, Take refuge in him. And so these psalms are, I think, intended as a way of helping us do those very things. Appreciate his sovereignty, his rule, 
appreciate his anointed one and really take comfort in that. Now, who does he mean by his anointed here? This is sort of similar to uh, Nick on Wednesday. My, most directly, you know, this does, we don't know who wrote Psalm 2, probably not David since it's not attributed to it. Maybe it's someone else. So who, who do they probably have in mind as God's appointed? The king. The king. Probably David. And yet, like in Psalm 22, do you get a sense that, well, this isn't just about David? Or, well, yeah, what, what sorts of things give a hint that this, or hints or clues, maybe I should say more than hints, but clues, that this is not just about David. What did he say about him? Because the son, you know, you're my son, I've anointed you, I will make the nations your inheritance. Now, Chuck Webb was like, who are the nations? Well, us, <laughs> our ancestors, you know, we, we've often in churches like ours used the term Gentiles. It's, that term's not widely used anymore in general conversation. The nations was the, that was the reference of what we refer to as the Gentiles. The, any non-Jewish countries, essentially. And he says, hey, they're going to become your inheritance. But yet, what are they doing right now? What are these nations? How does he portray them in this song? <clears throat> Raging. They conspire a lot against God's appointed and his people. And so one of the messages of this, and you see this in other songs, and I think this is important for us in our era too. It is it shocking that there are whether countries or individuals or leaders or groups who rage against God? Well, no. <laughs> no, I mean, this was true in 1000 BC. This is going to be true. We shouldn't be you know, surprised by it or discouraged by the fact that, oh, you know, again, we think, oh, you know, things aren't the way they were. That, look, in many ways, things aren't the way they've been, except, I will say, Psalm 2, if you were in Revelation, Lawrence did a very good job. I'm not even going into detail. You can watch the video if you want. But relating how Psalm 2 really is a template, in many ways, for what transpires in the book of Revelation. In fact, there are specific references like this ruling the nations with the iron scepter. I mean, that comes straight out of some two. They're kissing the sun. And what are the nations doing in Revelation? Raging, persecuting, <clears throat> killing. And yet he says what is on to and in Revelation? Who's ultimately God knows what's going on. God isn't going to allow this to overcome his mission. And his son, the anointed one, is going to break the nations into the pottery. And so, you know, to find comfort in the idea that we serve the God of heaven. Do we, you know, we might ask ourselves, do we really believe that? Do we really believe that whatever is going on around us, whatever we see, ultimately is going to work toward his end? You know, think about the very crucifixion and the arrest of Jesus. What are some examples of people doing things that they think are working against Jesus or God, or Jesus in this case, and yet we're all like right into God's way? Pharisees you know, put him before 
the Roman Council, who they hated. Yeah. Uh, in order to yeah. get rid of this man who's bothering them. Yeah. But they charge him with saying, I am the king of the Jews. Well, he is the king of the Jews, and they, here they are saying, this is the mechanism we're going to use to accuse you. Who do they ask? Who does Pilate, I'm going to say, let me give you Barabbas. And they said, no, no, we don't want Barabbas. We want Jesus. And yet, like, right, they're doing the very thing. Could Barabbas hide our sins? <laughs> you know, and, and so I, I go on and on about this all too. Like I said, just think of it as this is a way of thinking about how useful this collection is and the sorts of things we should think about. So, next is this widely, widely used poem. Maybe the most highest psalm of all Psalm 23. Julia asked me, she goes, did you set this up or you're gonna be, I said, no, it just happened that way, but you know, I wasn't too upset about it. But what I would ask you to do here, you know, as we read this, or before we read it, uh, Isaac Winston, I made a point on Psalm 22, us thinking about ourselves in David's you know, putting ourselves in his eyes. And so here, what, what's David doing? What's sort of the background, backdrop for this all of David? What's his, as a youth, what's his occupation? Shepherd. Shepherd. And so what's this setup for this song? Um, he's the shepherd, he's got the sheep, but now he turns it at it what way? The Lord is the right. shepherd over me. I'm the sheep. Yeah, he's David the now becomes the sheep. And he's and the God of heaven is the shepherd. So what I would ask you to do as best you can, put yourself in the eyes of David, sitting on some side or some hill by some stream in 1000 BC, sitting there looking at the sheep that you have care of. Put yourself in that position and now thinking of yourself, think of yourself as one of the sheep. Right? Brett, would you read this for us? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know, this is an example of what we talked about. This is sort of a song, songs or a song book, but a song book that's a collection of various sorts of meditations and prayers. This is more of the meditation or self talk that then David has turned into a song that is sung in the community. And like I said, it starts with the sheep thinking so that way he ends that the second part really switches the imagery and becomes one of a supper at a household. Let me ask you all, what what phrase putting yourself in this position as the sheep, what the phrase or what imagery here really speaks to you? And the sheep is reliant solely on the shepherd for sustaining life, for leading them, as it says in the green pastures. He, the shepherd is providing everything that we need necessary for life. And then within that, 
you still want the comfort and the guidance. And, you know, even when you read my cup, you know, overflows, my head is anointed. God is even blessing you beyond all the basic necessities we need for life even. Yeah. He pretty much took all the imagery there. So you, you may not have to show you. Any other imagery that really speaks to each other? For you are with me. You are with me. How would, again, think of David and his sheep. What, what's he drawing out of here? He's out there in the midst of all sorts of dangers. He, his flock needs protection. He needs protection, comfort, strength. Yeah. Apparently uh, he talks about being valley of the shadow of death. Yeah. So near death. You know, he's facing death, perhaps. And not facing death, but a situation that looks like it could be deadly. And yet, he looks for you or with me. Yeah, a shepherd lives with the sheep. You know, it's not like James cows and goes out and beats over and then goes back to the house and you know, like you all you're out here on your own now, you know. But it's like Jay is living out there. I'm gonna walk around with them, we're gonna I'm gonna sit with them, I'm gonna protect them. Yeah, that, that's quite a quite the imagery that God lives with us the way David or any other shepherd lives with their sheep. And what, that, that's important, and Chuck kind of gets at this. He makes this reference to, wow, this is one of these psalms that's, you know, you can tell David's feeling good when he writes this. This isn't one of the psalms like, Lord, where are you? You know, it's not Psalm 22. This is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling exalted and feeling exultant toward God that, hey, he's there, he's with me, takes care of me the way I try to take care of the sheep. But he contemplates, you know, I, I walk these sheep through, you know, in Israel, these ravines and alleys. I walk to the places that the sheep are thinking, ah, I don't know about this. This looks dark and dangerous. I, I came up with this picture. I don't know how well that you can see that there, but you know. Now, is this just a rose colored glasses, overly optimistic view of the world? But when he says, I will fear no evil. Does do you think David never felt fear after thinking this? Right. He has enemies. <laughs> he has enemies. We see others alms that he writes that he's feeling all sorts of negative emotions. Hey, you know, we we gotta remind ourselves that the alms are full of poetry. And one of the things that Poetry are sometimes overstatements. We go hyperbole for, for emphasis. <clears throat> and you've got to be careful about taking something too literally. And yes, people of God are going to feel fear. That I, 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 Julie and I happened the other night. We, I don't want the channels, we were flipping over there. They, our DVR recorded uh, the Band of Brothers series that we've seen before. And, you know, you watch that and you think, oh, my word. You know, it, it's a way of taking what is David talking about here from the abstract and thinking in a concrete way that the scene I've got on this side over here where these paratroopers are flying into Normandy and black is coming up and dinging off the plane and some planes are going down. And I don't you, I said, I, you know, it's just hard to imagine. At first I thought, well, you know, nobody in our church, while we face many things, nobody really faces something like this. But I thought, well, wait a minute. Our departed brother, the many of you would know, Ray Thomas, he was injured by a grenade landing on Pacific Island, 
in a firestorm that is as bad as a Omaha Beach. You know, that, do you think right on the spells of fear? Do you think someone who loves and has total trust in God, or as much as we have trust in God, do you think they would still feel fear hearing bullets banging on the, the landing crab? Well, you'd have to. You know that this other picture is a film depicting the landing on Omaha Beach. And it, oh, again, yeah, it's just, <laughs> I can't imagine being in those kind of circumstances. Okay. But, Did you talk to John Birch Sr. or yeah. Jason Songer? Yeah, I was going to say Jason Songer, John Birch Sr. Jason Songer, if you don't know, is, was in Air Force Special Forces Pararescue dropping into places, enemy places, to rescue and pull out stranded U.S. soldiers. <laughs> that would be, okay, drop. Who's gonna rescue me? And I'm sure, you know, you do this, and as is depicted in one of these, in fact, one of these episodes, one of the, platoon leader says, you know, to a private who's sort of frozen in fear, look, everybody here is afraid. It's dealing with that. And what, how does Psalm 23 and David's thought, what's the difference between having the kind of fear that freezes us, causes us just to be anxious and not have difficulty dealing and yet, what allows David to think about, I can overcome very difficult circumstances. What's the difference? You are with me. You are with me. You know. Doesn't depend on me. Right. So think about what I want you to do again. We, we do have the Ray Johnson's or Hatton and Jay Stalker or St. John for Senior. But we, you know, hard, very few of us live in that, have lived in that, that experience. But does that mean we don't have things that cause us anxiety? Well, I won't ask you to relate this, but what, what causes anxiety for you? What causes you to be really troubled and to have, you know, you, you might not describe it as fear, you might describe it in by another word, like it's not even, but something that causes you to think, yeah, this, I, I, it's even hard for me to think about that. Well, can you just make that evaporate? In fact, both in the Old Testament, New Testament, and in our lives, are people going to die that we love? Is our health and the health of other people going to be in very bad shape sometimes? Will families that we care about break up? I mean, yeah, all of this goes on. Those are things that, you know, I don't think any of us want to just dwell on and contemplate, but yet Scripture, I think, tries to help us see not Believe in a God doesn't lift all the curse of Genesis 3. The troubles that come on humanity are still going to come on us. Revelation makes that point. But what do we have? A shepherd who's with us. In fact, again, this connects to Revelation. And those of you who are in here, what point? What what really stands out in Revelation one? This tremendous description of the resurrected and glorified Jesus Christ, but yet what's he doing? You remember? I know some of you were with me here somewhere. Matt was up there on a pick up him. You remember, I, I, I know that, I, I, I can't remember at 
just we talked about that. I just have a picture of him walking around with the churches amongst the candlesticks, and the, he's he's with us. He's you know, spirit is dwelling here with us. Yes. And, and even though we're afraid, and even though bad things could happen, he's still with us. Yeah, that's the very that there are these candlesticks that represent the churches, and Jesus Himself is walking among the churches, and He's speaking to them, and He's saying, "Hey," and He has His angels communicating with them, and like Ryan says, I think this is the message of the Spirit of God being our helper. Not again. I think as I think Morris talked about this not too long ago. It's not the point that God's Spirit helps us exactly the way He helped the apostles. He doesn't give us revelations that we write down. And He certainly uses those revelations to help us. But things like Romans 8, He, he helps us in our prayers. We try to pray to God and He says the Spirit uses our prayers but then praise uh, helps us in a way to communicate those to the Father in ways that are a benefit to us. And we'll also use other passages to refer to how the Spirit of God is helping God's people. And we see that throughout the book of Acts, sometimes in ways that are miraculous, but I think also in ways. And so remember this imagery. He is our shepherd. He lives with us. And through his Son and through his Spirit, we have other points you all want to make about Psalm 23? Um, I just think it's really uh, comforting to know that when you go to him with those fears, he doesn't chastise you, he sustains you. I'm really glad I had something like that in my notes and I've forgotten about it. Don't feel guilty about feeling anxiety. I think sometimes we read something like Psalm 23 and we think, well, I shouldn't have felt anxious. Look, this, these are natural human emotions or things we're concerned. The thing that we have from Psalm 23, it's not a message of, well, if you're fearing, you, you are a bad Christian. It's, if you feel anxiety and fear, among other things that may help you. And there are you know, many things in the world and that, that even those who don't believe in Christ, you know, it helps, that may help people. But fundamentally, the starting point here is to remember God is with you. I, this image of the revela revelation of it is thinking of Jesus Christ standing beside you. Well, what could you do if you right now you saw the very literal resurrected Savior standing beside you? What do you feel like you could overcome? It'd be like Peter pulling out a sword, but oh, hey, I may have one sword, but it's me and Jesus. We can handle this. And the farther God and His Spirit and Jesus seek from us. That puts us more in that feeling of Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But even there, as we talked about, coming back to our lives, well, okay, I'm feeling this, but he really is with me. He can help me through anything. And yet, that's not putting down other helps that we may avoid, but it is recognizing that's a critical help. Jay, you have to I was just going to, I think, Basically, just summarizing what you said, you know, anxiety with me is when you start thinking about putting your trust in something else. You know, you, young men put their trust in health, but they're going to lose it, right? You might have a great family, but at some time, you're going to lose them, like you said. You might have a great job, feel secure in it, but you're going to lose it sometime. We may live a part of a great country, right? And, and it, the country's made up of fallible people, and it's going to fall. So all of that can, if you think about all of that and knowing that things can go bad, can step back and say, no, there's a creator who spoke this world to existence. He's in control of everything, and he loves those people that seek him. He loves the sheep 
that listen to the shepherd, right? Right. And uh, but, you know, I don't know if you meant this out of Revelation one, but he, Jesus said, "I'm the, the first and the last. I'm yeah. the beginning and the end. He's going to be there from the start to the end." And if we can take a breath when we feel everything coming down and, and think about, no, there is a God in heaven that's in control of everything. That gives us great peace. And I think that's the application of this today for us. Yeah, I, the Lord's has really emphasized this over the last decade, and it's, it took a while to sink in with me, but it's different things in life hit. You know, much of our prayers are devoted to avoiding bad outcomes. And look, it's Scripture gives us many precedents of that, as Holmes does. But Lawrence has really emphasized, well, another thing emphasized as Holmes says, Lord, help me through the difficult times. Because no matter how deep our faith is, our faith is not going to, and our prayers are not going to eliminate every bad outcome. And if we live our lives just in hope that we can avoid any negative things that that's not realistic it's recognizing that he's with us and keep talking think about this in the good times talking up to yourself the very things that someone like David's talking up here if you, the more you talk up to yourself in the good times who God is, what he's doing, how he's our shepherd, the more you're prepared for the, the valleys of darkness. Chuck? Kind of to that point, I was going to call our attention to the right after, for you are with me, so your rod and your staff, they comfort me. We need to think about what the good shepherd does. He has both a, a rod and a staff. And it's my understanding staff is kind of what he used as he uses as he leads the flock. The rod is like a weapon. It's you know, throw that rod at the wolf or mm -hmm. whatever the enemy is that's trying to get after the flock. Well the rod I mean, is right and I think that's a good way of illustrating too. I think one of the big battles of Alms is all twenty three. I think we can all understand this in the abstract. We think, well, that's a really neat idea. How do I make that much more tangible? How do I make that much more real for myself? Well, that's, I think, exactly what David is doing here, mm -hmm. putting himself in the position of the sheep. Now, again, maybe for you, well, I, I can't quite fully get into the shepherd mentality. Well, put yourself in some other position. Put yourself in a position that you are in, that you have responsibility over something. You can have children, other things, and think of your care for them. And think, okay, now let my, let's switch positions. I'm going to become the child and think about God as me. You know, how much, you know, this hit me when Merritt left for college, you know. It, yeah, I, w I knew I would miss her, and I really did, but part of it, too, is just felt like, well, the, our whole structure, our family, and our relationship, everything's changing. And for a I hardly ever cried the first 25 years of marriage. For a month, I found myself just, you know, crying over this, and I thought, man. But as I thought more and more about this, I realized, you know, one of the lessons out of this, it shows me how much God loves me. Whatever I'm feeling toward her, he feels even more deeply toward me. And praying regarding him, and asking him to help me through this and saying, Lord, I know you're teaching me lessons here. And Part of it is teaching me that, well, you can't, in this life, you can't hold on to everything that you, you, know, you like to follow. And the longer you live, the more of those things that happen. You know, friends that you try to always be close with, you know, give them away. Children that, you know, you hold dear, they grow up. And so, let me move on to Psalm 25. I'm just gonna cover it quickly. I'll read some of this, not all of it. 
But again, it's about trusting in God, and it's from David. And you, Lord, my God, I put my trust. I trust in you. Don't let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame, but shame will come on those who are treacherous without God. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Remember, Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from old. Did not remember the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you, Lord, are good. We talked about this some in the tension to parents class. Faith is somewhat of a paradox in Scripture. Where, who's responsible for faith? I know that's, I know that, I know sort of a, one of those questions, you know, what are you asking? Yeah. But is faith God's in or our in? It's why well, it's ours. You know, throughout Scripture, people are encouraged, grow in faith, have faith, trust in me. And yet, is it only us? What did Jesus? What did the twelve ask of Jesus? Lord, increase our faith. That <laughs> through His Word, as you can see here but in ways that we might not always be aware of through the working of the Spirit in our lives. We need God also to help foster and grow our faith. And that seems to be what David is saying here. I trust in you. I believe in you, but I need you to help me too, Lord. I need, I need my faith to grow. And yes, by thinking on the Word and meditating on it, can do that. He goes on to say, Good and upright is the Lord, and therefore he instructs sinners in his way. He guides the humble in what is right, and he teaches them his way. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful toward those who keep the demands of his covenant. For the sake of your name, Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. It's a great statement. Does being a person of faith mean you're sinless? No, he's asking forgiveness of his sins here. What allows this sinner, though, to be in a relationship with God? What, what, character, what characterizes the person being described here? Is it, does it talk about, well, just because I can, you know, I can name all 12 apostles, and I can name every judge, and the humble, the humble the contrite, the one who feels very bad because of their sin, and is confessing that to God. You know, Isaiah writes the very words of God. You know, he asks, who's going to build for me a house? You know, who's going to, you know, heaven's my throne and the earth is my footstool. Who's going to build a house to me? The one that I look to is the one who is poor in spirit and who is contrite. You know, those are, those are the fundamental qualities that connect, on our end, connect us to God. In fact, if you ask, why, why am I, why are others, why am I in trouble connected to God? Well, maybe the humility of not just as opposed to, you know, the puffed up, loud mouth person, but the self-centered person. And we all struggle with that, to thinking of myself as the center of the universe. And he goes on then and says, turn to me and be gracious to me, for I'm lonely and afflicted. Leave the troubles of my heart and free me from anguish. Look on my affliction and my distress and take away all my sins. Wanted, I was hoping to leave a little bit more time for this. Do you find yourself in need at times? That's a rhetorical question. All of us have needs. Some of us feel very needy at times. Well, why not use this as an example? It's on that it's not just about self-talk. This is on that seems to be based on a prayer to God. Well, why not pray these very words? 
or if these don't quite fit your voice, use these words and modify them a bit to speak to God, to say things to Him like, Lord, I need your grace to come to me. Lord, I feel alone and I feel pressed down, like everything's against me. I'm anxious, I'm troubled in my heart. I've got enemies, I've got things that are against me. Please guard me, guard those that I care about. You know, those kinds of words, practicing, thinking, talking to God, taking psalms, and again, praying them as a heart or using them as a basis to pray in your own words, I think is one of the best uses that we can find in psalms. And will empower your prayers and build your relationship with God. Talking to Him, think about it, talking to God using the very words or similar words that David used. That's, that's a very empowering way to relate to God. Other points you might want to make, we've only got a minute or two, I think, here. Verse 11 really stands out to me. Um, Which one is that? Uh, verse 11 in, in Psalm 25. Yeah, I don't have that. Uh, where he says, for your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity. And thinking about forgiveness for, for me, and David prays for forgiveness numerous times in this psalm, but God forgiving my sins for his name's sake, for his glory, elevates him. There's another verse that says, fear the Lord, for with him is forgiveness. And now, thinking well, that's about, a segue to Wednesday night. We're going to talk about that very soon. <laughs> Just the forgiveness that is glorious to God. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, Paul.